The Death Citadel Deep by Will Ryder. Chapter 54 Stone Circles. Rote still has things to see in the Salisbury area. He's already come very close to Old Sarum, and stirringly so with Salisbury people. There are still a few other sites in the vicinage, like megalithic Stonehenge, the earthen mound Sil Silbury Hill, and the lesser known Avebury Stone Circle. The following morning, he awakes motivated by an agenda that will be met by the only means available, an appeal for funds. He does so by laying his black capped baseball cap a foot in front of himself. He begs for money while sitting in a doorway, kitty corner to the ancient arch leading into the Salisbury Cathedral Close. He pays close attention to the way people bow before kindly donating to the cause. He thinks it's to, it to, be, to be very respectful. Others walk by with their heads turned far in the other direction. Some look right at him with ill intent for his intrusion upon their space. One fellow in particular is so peeved when he walks by that he deems wrote with distaste, disgust, and utter disappointment upon hearing the constant call. Excuse me, can you spare some change? It's all in a day's work. By the end of the afternoon, Rote has enough to replenish his famish and forge ahead in the morning to take a coach to Avebury. You see the ancient stone circles sitting there. That night it rains heavily. He nearly suffocates while inserted in his plastic bag with the lip folded. It prevents any water from getting in and any air getting out. His breath creates condens condensation quickly. The air seems stifled as Rote and the plastic bag heaves and thrills with each heartbeat and breath. He awakes wet and without breath. He has a hammering headache. His canine companions seem to be away for the day. Even fresh air seems hard to find. He's stifled by his own stench. All his stuff is soaking wet. His shoes, socks, and sleeping bag. His orange garbage bag is dripping wet from his own sweat and breath. It's not a moment to all of a sudden be surprised by a high school sweetheart. He's shrouded in shrubbery and sure no one knows. So wet with all, he spreads out his sleeping bag, his sleeping suit, as best he can under the circumstances. He hopes it'll dry somewhat before having to roll it up and head to where he plans to stay, Avebury. But an hour later, he rolls his ro rolls up his roll, still damp, but will, will do under the milieu. He burrows his bags deeper into a thicket before beginning his day, under overcast skies wearing damp dungarees. Rope walks by now a well-traversed route into Salisbury and makes his way to the Rakote station. He pays for a fare to the village of Avebury, in Wiltshire, some distance away. On the coach, he peers out after wiping a portal through the foggy windows to see his secret hideaway shrouded in shrubs. A hedgerow hedges it in as the bus barrels by, up the hill away from Old Sarum and on towards Avebury. Rote rolls into Avebury and is immediately taken by the scope of the largest megalithic stone circle in the world surrounding the village. His eyes see an inner sanctum of stone circling out into too much larger circles encircling the entire circumference of the area. The spiraling stones hypnotize him. The standing stars and stones stand eight to ten feet in height with a width of an ardent arm span. Parallel to the stones in some of the larger circle spirals is a henge, a ring, bank, and ditch-like moat surrounding the site. Bro wonders if it's always so or constructed to accompany the grandeur of the giant standing stars and stones, or is it for irrigation purposes? The stones themselves must have been hauled there thousands of years ago, and like Stonehenge, the how and the from where is speculative. Rote follows the circle circumference as it grows wider. He soon comes to a long promenade of stones. They form an elongated entrance into the spiraling stone megalith mainframe. While walking through the grand entrance of the standing stars and stones lined the extent of those, Rote imagines, imagines he's passing through the old, through the old garden as in ancient arch arches known as Druid Dolmens. Rote passes through and climbs over the ridge, shadowing the Arcane Avenue. He knows on the other side stands the earthen mound of Silbury Hill. He hears about its location when just off the bus, near the thatched roof of Red Lion Inn in Avebury. He enters the shop, not too far from the stands. The person Rote meets inside is quite knowledgeable about all the prehistoric intrigue in the area. He fills road in and all that abounds and to be found around the shadow of the mound. So with 
Silvery Hill honed in. He hikes over the ridge and back down the other side. He hikes by what seems to be several huge tomb-shaped stones, some lying half-covered in a wet ditch. He knows barely that barrels are megalithic mausoleums, and through though gravestones imply a burial site, he's not sure he stumbled upon the West Kennet Long Barrow. He continues towards the, lo- the tallest man-made mound in Europe. It's fenced in, so he has to climb over a wire fence, circling the pyramid-like prehistoric chalk mound. He makes note of the ridge or grid line winding around it. Also, behind the hill, an overhanging ridge lies an image of a white horse, presumably carved out from the earthen overhang. Though earth usually connotes with black dirt, the earthen equine is in white clay, milky in nature, and presumably opalescent as well. Why the white horse, though? Now on top, he hops another fence circling the crown of the hill. Once over, the rover steps into the circle of white clay stones piled like a cairn in the center. How deep, who knows, though deep enough to have an unheeded warning sign posted on a high wire fence surrounding the chalky cairn. The sign suggests the integrity of the fairly high hill is hollow or has been hollowed out, or something along that around it here. The road thinks whoever built the mound and filled it with a cairn of white clay chunks must have held the clay in high regard and white horses. After placing a couple of chunks of white clay in his pocket, Rope returns via the colossal colonnade. He sees a Tao talisman, strangely stuck in one of the sarsen stones. He pries it loose and puts it in his pocket before heading back to catch the bus. And again, he's grateful for yet another part of England in Europe. After the bus and back in his hedgerow hideout, he settles down for the night, realizing he'll have to beg again the following day, that thought getting harder to remind. Rhoda wakes sore and wet yet again, and as if by rote, he shoes away another dog. Unlike yesterday, he needs to wait for a sleeping bag to lose some of its dampness before rolling it back up. Back down the two-mile walk from Old Sarum, he goes right through into Salisbury to the, to the old arch dividing the clothes from the rest of the city. It's where he sits and banks. After a few hours, he's discouraged by lack of donations. He leaves after managing to only pan a few pounds. He decidedly deems that after more than a week or so of begging, he's had enough. He has to keep moving on, so he sets his sights on Stonehenge, tonight as his, life, as his last rite. Back at his secret spot, well, it's no longer a secret to the dog and some of the owners. Some surely have spotted his brash bright orange plastic bag, big enough to, be, to hold him and his baggage bunched up like a bag of garbage through the porous hedgerow. The idea of putting himself into a garbage bag, especially a wet one, the wet weather and all, is not wearing well on him. With his bag still burrowed, he sits on the bench, believing if he leaves after 8 p.m., he'll be able to cover the distance to Stonehenge. And through the duration of the night, he'll arrive around dawn with access to the site before it opens to the public. With that decided, he looks at the sky. He sees the sun slowly sink. Soon the sun will be sacrificing a collage of colors. He sets out on foot with footwear falling apart. It flip-flops. The front is now separated from the sole, of, and the sole itself is so worn it feels like he's wearing nothing, as each pebble, rock, and stone attests to the thinness. It's still better than bare feet, though not by much. <laughs>